Hi folks, welcome to the weekend. I trust that you've had an excellent reading week. And talking of which, what have I been reading this week? I made it through Lord of Light by Roger Zelazny and that might be the best thing that I can say about it. I finished. We're on a colony planet, but there are Hindu gods running the show along with a Buddha, more than one maybe. For the first third of the book, I didn't have the first idea what was going on. I don't know much about the Hindu pantheon, so the various names and aspects mostly went completely over my head, not helped by the flowery language that Zelazny insists on using. I think I said last week that I almost bailed at the 30% mark, but I did push through it. Lord of Light, it becomes clear, is a tale of a fallen colony, a common enough trope in science fiction. Once you've travelled bajillions of miles in your fancy starship, what then? Sure, your supplies will last a while, you can make a good start, but the high tech breaks down, there's no industry to replace it, and after that you're basically farmers and pioneers. In covering this well-travelled ground, Zelazny certainly takes a different route than any other book that I've read on that subject. There are hints and glimpses at the history, the state of things on the planet, but most of the book is battles between various competing gods, between those that favour the status quo and where the gods and the favoured few live it up, and the accelerationists who believe that the populace at large should be given access to knowledge and technology and allowed to develop as they may. Things are reinvented here all the time. The printing press is a recent example given, but those innovations are quickly suppressed under the current regime. There's a house of karma that regulates reincarnation. There's a thunder chariot, which seems an awful lot like a shuttlecraft, and the gods' powers seem to emanate from old technology rather than any supernatural ability. So there were things that I liked, but overall I found the business with the Hindu pantheon very baroque, and I found the language the prose style, I suppose, distracting. I'm sorry to disappoint those of you that really love Lord of Light and we're looking forward to hearing what I thought, but I'm not a huge fan. But I think that's okay. Life would be very boring if we all liked the same books. On audiobook this week, I finished the award-winning In Ascension by Martin McInnes, and this is best described as literary science fiction. It did get a sniff at the Booker Prize, which told you something, I think. It's not a pew-pew space opera, it's not a time travel adventure, and there are no aliens. This is a more serious fare. Well, well actually, there is a bit of time travel, sort of, and it's strongly implied that there are aliens, so he did manage to sneak those in there, despite it being highly literary, I think. In Ascension is really the life story of Lee Hassenbosch, who's a Dutch woman who goes on to be a marine biologist. The sections of the book are really Lee's life story, starting with her childhood, for which she has nostalgia despite the beatings from her austere father. We move on to her academic success as a student, to her first job on a research expedition, and her later work on a mysterious project which becomes less and less theoretical and more and more real. In Ascension is a book, I think, fundamentally about life, about rebirth, about family and connections, and about isolation, above all. At several points, McInnes makes neat links or callbacks to earlier episodes. Lee's father was a hydraulic engineer on Holland's dams and waterways, holding back the sea and creating new land. And Lee later visits a volcanic island where natural processes are achieving the same results. I really liked this book. In Ascension takes us from the depths of the ocean floor to the farthest reaches of the solar system. And I was struck as I was listening by how fragile life on our planet is. The oceans are deep, sure, and the vent featured in this book is even deeper, but even that depth is a rounding error compared to just the Earth's radius, small compared even to the atmosphere. The depths of this vent, by some distance deeper than any known point now, is a distance that I could run at a push in an hour. <laughs> Obviously I don't have to deal with crushing pressure and utter darkness on a typical run, nor do I run vertically, but still. My rather tortured point is that all life on Earth, all the life that we know exists for certain, even the most extremophile life, is in a tiny shell of a tiny world which is a vanishingly small speck in its own star system, never mind galactically. And I thought that McInnes did a great job of describing the scales in play here without directly making the point. I could maybe have done with a little bit less of Lee's sighing about her childhood and how difficult it was, and I thought that the ending was a little bit unsatisfying, but not fatally so, and it certainly didn't negate what had gone before, which is beautifully written and quite interesting. I really like the sense of wonder that Lee has for life, particularly the microscopic life on which she builds her career, and the audio book narration was really good too. If you're looking for bangy, crashy, in-your-face sci-fi, this isn't it, but if you're up for a beautiful piece of writing, a meditation on the connections between all life, the possibilities the universe might offer, then this might hit the spot for you. I loved it, and I have his two previous books as well, and I'll definitely be getting to those as soon as I can. Next, I read Service Model by Adrian Tchaikovsky, a man I wish he would slow down a bit and focus more on quality over quantity. As I've said several times before, his bad books are still pretty good, but I think he could reach the heights more often with less volume. 
that's just my inexpert opinion. And he does seem to be doing very nicely indeed without my advice, so what do I know? So, service model though. This is the tale of the robot apocalypse. Uh, Charles is a valet robot serving his master in an isolated mansion. This part for me was very reminiscent of the Solarian estates from the Asimov robot books. Charles executes his daily tasks, checking the travel itinerary for his master, setting out the day's clothes and so on. But it quickly becomes clear that his master is now a bloody corpse, the result of an unfortunate shaving incident. Charles then embarks on a quest to find a new master, a human that he can serve. And the problem is that there aren't any. Outside the isolated estate is a polluted wasteland. It's populated by piles of trash, some vermin, and some robots broken beyond repair, some trundling around in an infinite doom loop in a futile attempt to execute their unchanged task routines in the absence of any human instructions or even a functioning society in which to perform them. That all sounds a bit grim, but the tone of the book is light, with Tchaikovsky making witty references to the current state of things. And I smirked from time to time, I smiled on occasion, but I didn't find it laugh out loud funny. Certainly it wasn't hilarious. Charles meets a motley collection of fellow robots along the way, some helpful and some not, and some posing an existential threat to him. He talks himself out of many a situation using logic, and his companion for much of the book is the Wonk, a patchwork robot of uncertain provenance, shall we say, that encourages Charles, or un-Charles as he becomes, to think for himself, to break out of the strictures of his programmed role. I really liked the Wonk character, and there were some interesting elements in the book, but overall this was a Tchaikovsky miss for me, not a Tchaikovsky hit which is mid-table good for most authors, I think. On the plus side, my copy does have nice sprayed edges, so it's not all bad. I do think that the robots taking over thing is getting a bit saturated now. I feel like I've read a few recently, and I still have Sea of Rust on my shelves as well, as yet unread. Next, I blew through the 150 pages of Big Planet by Jack Vance. I read it in a couple of sittings yesterday. Now, having read Bob Shaw's Orbitsville and the first of Robert Silverberg's Magipore books recently, it's interesting to read another tour guide kind of book set on a vast landscape, but written 20 or 30 years earlier in the 1950s. A team of commissioners from Earth heads to Big Planet to check out the Barjanum of Beaujolais. There are rumours of him being a bit of a, an oppressor. And the planet is located outside Earth's area of responsibility. It's where rebels and peoples that didn't want to live under Earth's organised but restricted rule went. Claude Glistra is the lead of his delegation, but there's immediately an issue on arrival. They crash land far from their intended landing point at Earth Enclave. To get there, they have a 40,000 mile trek, over one and a half times the circumference of the Earth. Over the course of Big Planet, the group gets whittled down, there are betrayals and concealed intentions, and we get introduced to several different isolated communities and taken on a heart-stopping ride on a sort of wind-powered wooden cable car. There's a lot of adventuring packed into what's quite a short book, and I whipped through it yesterday in, as I said, a couple of sittings. There is a sequel set on the Big Planet showboat, uh, which I'll get to at some point as well. A Big Planet was my first Jack Rance book, and I did enjoy his writing style, so I will certainly be exploring more of his work. Uh, I've also made a start on Eastern Standard Tribe by Cory Doctorow, that one on audiobook, which is read by the author. And I've also started Ascent by Jed Mercurio. And so far, of the two, I'm enjoying Ascent much more. But still, it's early days for both, so who knows. What have you been reading this week? Is there anything that you'd recommend? Do let us know. It's always really good to hear from you. Channel stuff next then. Subscribers are at 3045, which is up a modest 11 on last week. But if you're one of that group, or if you've just found my channel for the first time today, a huge welcome to you. I'm John, this is Sci-Fi Scavenger, and I focus on reading, collecting, and chatting about science fiction, old and new. Comment of the week was from Mars Rock, who spotted the non-culture and indeed non-sci-fi Ian Banks books on the shelf behind me on one of my recent videos, and wondered if I would consider doing a video focusing on those. And good news, I do have a couple of Ian Banks related videos in mind. One focused on the culture novels, which I'm almost finished rereading, probably some kind of ranking I expect, and another focused on his non-culture SF novels, which will include some of his non-genre books, which I think have sci-fi elements. Thanks to Mars Rock for leaving a comment, and thanks to all of you that do the same. It's always much appreciated. Let us take a look at what was on the channel this week. On Sunday, there was a look back at my reading during July, a bumper crop of 11 science fiction books. I give a mini review of each one, ranking them in the process, and then I'm obliged to make a decision about my book of the month, a toss-up between two excellent books. And actually, that was it. I had planned to share my Ken McLeod collection, which I completed the other day, but I didn't quite get it done. 
There was a fair bit more preparation than I'd anticipated, but it is now recorded at least, so that will be coming soon. This week I've watched a couple of things. It's always good to hear from Matt at Book Pilled. He reviewed the five books he's enjoyed reading most this year. I don't always agree with his take on a book, and actually he often absolutely detests books that I've enjoyed a lot, and vice versa. But he does a good job of a grown-up review, I think. I watched Steve, outlaw bookseller, author, collector give some advice for Elric newbies. Of the six Moorcroft books that he suggests as an initial focus, I only have Stormbringer and it's the last of the six in the suggested reading order. Michael Moorcock is on my list of shame and I do intend to knock him off that this year, but it seems like I'll have to start somewhere else in his backlist. And finally, I also watched Kenny declare a small victory on his mission to collect all zillion and one of the Yellow Spine door books. And he's still fighting that battle, but he has completed the first 100 of the numbered set, which are also the books that he read as a youngster and so have an additional thrill of nostalgia for him. On the book buying front, I've been a busy bee. I've taken delivery of a few things this week, a new book, plus that final McLeod book to add to my Ken McLeod collection. But I also went book shopping in London on Sunday with a YouTube chum, Whitney of Secret Source of Storycraft, who's in the UK for a vacation. We hit a couple of used bookshops that I know of and a few books were picked up there, but then we went on to Forbidden Planet on Shaftesbury Avenue. Now I haven't been to Forbidden Planet for decades, so it was really fabulous to visit. They have a super range of science fiction and they had a sale on too, so we went moderately crazy on the 99p books. My pile of books to be hauled has now reached a dangerous level of teetering. On the channel this week there will be that overview of my Ken McLeod collection, that will probably be on Sunday, and then during the week, probably Tuesday, maybe Wednesday, will be August's book haul, which is going to be, I think, pretty sexy as these things go, so do watch out for that if you like a good book haul. I'm also working on a video looking at some of the key science fiction books of the 1960s, but that's still very much work in progress and is unlikely to land in this coming week. Reading wise, I shall finish Ascent and Eastern Standard Tribe. In fact, I think I'll finish this tomorrow. It's um, it, the audio books marching through it pretty quickly. I have some short stories that I need to pack in somewhere. And then I think I shall tackle Beyond Hallowed Earth by the aforementioned Ken McLeod. And after those, I will have just three books left on August's TBR and hopefully just over two weeks in which to read them. Without wishing to jinx anything, it seems possible that I'll be able to fit another book or two, or maybe even three, into this month's planned reading. I have a couple of candidates for that kind of queue jumping, but we'll see how I get on next week before being too impulsive. As always, thank you for watching, have a super weekend, and until next time, goodbye for now. <laughs>